few things I want to cover this evening, and um, I want to get right into it, but I do have uh, a preliminary thing or two to, to bring up. One is um, uh, I, I want to speak of my, uh, my appreciation. Some of you either in class or uh, at the end of class or in, um, in emails have um, told me how you're using the material and how it's been a blessing to your uh, Bible study and to your understanding of the Word of God. And um, that is very encouraging to me. My goal for the class is that everybody in class, no matter no matter where you start, because we've got quite a variety of people, no matter where you start, my goal is that you'll be better Bible students, better interpreters at the end than you were at the beginning. Not necessarily that you're all going to be in the same place, but that you'll be you'll you'll be able to see progress in in what you're doing and you'll have more insight into um, how to study and in the wonder and the depth of um, of the word of God. So uh, I, I appreciate the ones of you who have uh, shared with me that um, um, reading the text over and over again and looking for the kinds of things that uh, we've talked about here has been uh, has been helpful to you. Uh, also, I appreciate <clears throat> very much the questions, uh, questions and comments that I get in class. There are times when I may, um, I may, how do I want to put it? I may put off your question a little bit because sometimes some of the questions that come in are anticipating things that I'm going to uh, present later in a later session. And um, so I, I think it'd be better not to get into those now, but later. So in some cases, I may ask you to hold on to that question until till we get there or there are other times when um when uh the, the it's a good question but it diverts us from what i'm trying to present and um uh, i may ask you to hold on to that question too and uh if if time allows and i'll i'll try to uh, give some time for this later on in the course maybe i will have some time when you can just ask ask some of your questions that you've been storing up. Anyway, this evening we are continuing with, um, with in-depth Bible study. We've talked about quite a number of things coming down uh, to this point. One of the things I presented last week, and some of you asked for more illustrations of it, talked about chiasmus. If you remember, chiasmus comes from the word chi, which is a uh, which is a Greek letter and looks like looks sort of like an X, and uh, it's a pattern, a literary pattern, or it's a literary device that's used throughout the Bible, and um, it's a literary device with a purpose. Um, not only how do I want to is it pleasing and but it emphasizes certain things. And I gave one example last week, but I'll give you two more examples today, which may help clarify. One of these is from Mark chapter 2, verse 27. And it's the words of Jesus where he says, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Notice the key words, Sabbath and man. The Sabbath was made for the for man, Sabbath man. And then in the second line, uh, man was not made for the Sabbath. So you've got, it begins with Sabbath, it ends with Sabbath, and in between you've got man and man. And if you draw an X from man to man and to Sabbath, you get that, that the, uh, kind of a, an illustration of that, uh, of that literary pattern. This is a very simple chiasmus, the really the simplest form of it. 
and um, it emphasizes, I think, the nature the nature of the Sabbath, that's really what's being emphasized, the nature of the Sabbath in relationship to human beings. Okay, another illustration. It's found in Genesis 2 and 3. Uh, Genesis 2 is a continuation of the creation account. First chapter of Genesis has the big panoramic view of God creating everything. And then at the end of that time, at the beginning of chapter two, he rests. It doesn't mean he was tired. It means he ceased his creative work. Then for the rest of chapter two, the, the real emphasis is on human beings. Human beings have been introduced in the first chapter of Genesis and the creation of them has been introduced there. But in chapter two, it's sort of like um, close up. Here's a, here's a close up on the creation of, of human beings. And there's, a, uh, there's what has sometimes been called, and I think accurately, the uh, order of creation. And if you, and if you look, at, look at the account without reading all of it, Hopefully you're familiar with it and you'll you'll see what I'm doing here. Adam is created first. So first you've got Adam. Then Eve is created second. Then in chapter three, the serpent comes and tempts them. Who's he tempt first? Eve. Notice Adam, Eve, and then Eve again. Then uh, she she is tempted and falls, and then the man is tempted and falls. There's Adam again. Then God comes, and he confronts the pair with their sin, their rebellion in the garden. Who's Who does he confront first? You would think maybe he would confront Eve first since she was the first one to fall, but he doesn't. He, he confronts the man. So Adam. Adam takes it like a man and says, it's not my fault. It's that woman that you gave me. In one fell swoop, he has managed to blame Eve and God for, for his disobedience. But anyway, so you've got Adam, Eve, and creation. Then in fall, the fall, you've got Eve and Adam. Then when, he con when God confronts them, you've got Adam and Eve. Eve says... The serpent deceived me. So then you've got the serpent, odd man out. Okay. Then from the serpent, it goes back to Eve and God's judgment on her, the curse. And then he goes back to Adam and ends with Adam. So you notice this is a series of chiasmuses. And that gives you an idea of how complicated this can be. And the series, I believe, has the effect of showing the priority of Adam before the fall. Some people say it, it's a function of the fall. It's not. He was created first. You have to ask the question, why was he created first? Because God could have created him at the same time. He could have created Eve first. He created Adam first. We could go into more detail on that because there's more there, but I'll leave it at that point. But notice it's just a series of chiasmuses. And in the one, rather than the simple form of four elements, you've actually got five because you've got the serpent. And um, when you have what I call odd man out in the chiasmus, when, for instance, if, if you had rather than four, if you had five, the odd man out is uh, gets the emphasis. Otherwise, the emphasis falls on on the, the the first and last item, which will be the same, in this case, Adam. But in that one chiasmus, you've got the serpent in the center, in the center of the chiasmus between Adam and Adam and Eve and Eve. Hopefully that's clear. I can try to clear it up more if it's not clear. Um, 
but that gives you an idea. Chiasmus can be used very simply, like Jesus using it when he speaks of the Sabbath, um, or it can be very complicated, more complicated as we see in Genesis, um, and and it can even it can be it can be a literary device giving structure to one passage, but the passage may be an entire book, and I'll um, I'll address that a little bit more. A uh, little later in the course. Okay, does that help with chiasmus, or is that still a uh, still a puzzle? A puzzle. <laughs> what was that? Still a puzzle. Still a puzzle. What's yeah. puzzling about it? What is no what? It's chiasmus, really. So, start with Adam, then the Eve, then back to Eve. Back to Eve. Mm -hmm. then, then back to, to Adam. Then back to Adam, then put the serpent in it, which made five, right? When we come to the serpent, there's five. Otherwise, there's four all the way through. Okay. And even there, there's four. But there's, the, you might, if you visualize it, you've got Adam. It begins with Adam and ends with Adam. In between, you've got Eve and Eve. But right in the center, that's the way I illustrate it. Right in the center, you've got the serpent. Okay. And I believe the reason for that is the serpent gets the emphasis. And in, in Genesis, the serpent is the emissary of Satan. In the book of Revelation, it speaks of that ancient Satan as, an, as the ancient serpent. So if we've wondered about it, there it is. And, and in, when he speaks to the serpent, he, God gives the first dim prophecy of the coming of Messiah when he says that the serpent will um, bruise his heel but he but the but this one one born of the woman will crush the, Satan's head or the serpent's head so yeah there's a whole series Does that explanation help at all? Yeah, it, it does. It helps a lot. It helps a lot. Okay, How do you good. spell chiasma? Oh, C-H-I-A-S-M-U-S. C-H-I-A-S-M-U-S. M-U-S, yes. All right, got it. Okay, so let's continue. One of the things, uh, as we continue with this, one of the things to keep in mind is the um, is the grammar, the grammar of the passage. If um, if if you want to study Hebrew and Greek, then you'll need to know Hebrew and Greek grammar. But most of us, even if we study Hebrew and Greek, still most of us pro probably English is our first language. Um, if not, it's it's a very important language, and it may. But whatever language you read the Bible in, whatever is the language of your heart, the language of the heart, when it comes to reading the Bible, uh, you should know the grammar of that language. Now, again, if you know Hebrew and Greek, then you need to know Hebrew and Greek grammar. But one of the things that I found is, it's it's greatly helpful to understand English grammar in order to uh, uh, order to understand Hebrew and Greek grammar. If you don't understand your basic grammar for your own language, you're really going to have trouble with the others. So uh, I suggest spending time maybe in a refresher just of English grammar and how it works. Um, Earlier on in the course, I uh, recommended a book called The Elements of Style by Strunk and White. I would recommend that again. You might want to get, and there's some very good ones out there, might want to get a um, 
an English handbook that talks about the different parts of speech and how those how those work. Since most of us are going to spend most of our time studying the Bible in an English translation, we need to make sure that we understand um, English grammar. I will point out a couple of things that just give you an idea of why grammar is important. Um, a couple of words that uh, that stand out. One of them is therefore. If you're reading in a, a biblical book, especially the New Testament, but if you're reading in a biblical book and the writer says, therefore, always ask, what is there, th therefore, therefore? Well, why is it there? Because it, it's pointing something. I mean, if I say, da 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 and I'm going to town, therefore, I'll be there on Monday. You, you know that the therefore points back to something that happened before that I said bef before I inserted that word. So in Colossians, for this is just an example, Colossians 2.6, uh, he says, therefore, as you've received Christ Jesus as Lord, uh, continue to live in him. Therefore points back to something. And I believe what it actually points back to is, not just the section before, but to the whole first part of the book. But but it's an important question to ask. Therefore, okay, what is that pointing to? Another example, the word for, F-O-R, not the number, but the word for. When you see for, ask, why is it there? So that, for instance, Psalm, Psalm 117. Psalm 117, very short psalm. And notice, as I read, notice the word for. Praise the Lord, all, all nations. Extol, extol him, all peoples. For great is his steadfast love toward us, and the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord. This is a very, very brief psalm of praise. Notice it begins with praise. And by the way, praise the Lord is not praising the Lord. It's calling people to praise the Lord. Sometimes people act as if they've praised the Lord because they said, praise the Lord. Well, actually, that's not praising the Lord. It's, it's a call to people to praise the Lord. But I won't go any farther with that. You just think about it. But anyway, he's calling on people to praise the Lord. He's calling on all nations and all people to praise the Lord and to extol him. And then he gives his reason with the word for. We might substitute the word because. For or because. Great is his, God's, steadfast love toward us and the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. And then again, the call, praise the Lord. Um, or, or in the book of Proverbs, here's another example of how it works. Chapter four. Verses 1 and 2. Proverbs 4, 1 and 2. Hear, O sons of fathers, instruction, and be attentive, that you may gain insight. For I give you good pre precepts. Do not forsake my teaching. Okay. Uh, part of Proverbs is a father's instruction to his son. And here, the sons are called to listen to their father's instructions, to give attention. And then the reason is given in verse 2, for or because I give you good precepts. Listen up, because this is good stuff. Uh, do not forsake my teaching. Um, 
So those are just a couple of examples, but to know how a, how a, a noun or a verb or an adverb or an adjective functions, to know how sentences work is uh, is invaluable just in just in reading and um, and in the end how do I want to put it in the end we go back to something I said earlier in the course the single best skill you can develop as a bible student is the ability to read well and again, I say reading well doesn't mean you can read the words. People read, can read the words, but but don't don't see the meaning. Don't see how the this sentence fits with that sentence. How this paragraph fits with that paragraph. How this flows from this to this to this. Um, and the the more you get into how the language works. Uh, the, the more Bible study will will mean to you. Okay, next. I've touched on this before, but think historically. Think historically. What I mean by that is bring historical controls to bear on the text. The French historian Francois Simeon said that the historian or the interpreter, we would say, uh, needs to have a knowledge of the tracks of the author, that the author has left behind. Think of, think, think of your author, in the, whether it's Paul or Amos, has left tracks behind, and you're tracking him. Uh, you you are following where he's leading you. This is a, another way of saying something I've said earlier and repeatedly uh, in the course, that we are after the author's intended meaning. Some people are not really after the author's intended meaning. They read their own meaning in. So it's not what the author wrote or what the author meant, but it's what it means to me. Okay. And there is a place for saying what it means to you. But in order for the its meaning to you to be accurate, you've got to start with what the author meant. Simply taking the author's words and going zooming off somewhere in the wild blue with my meaning and if you and if you think i'm making something up here or just getting crazy for no reason this is done all the time it's amazing to me how often this is done where somebody takes a passage and takes it someplace the passage was never intended to go they're not thinking historically and again i'm not against asking the question what does this mean to me but that you can get a valid answer to that only by starting with what it actually meant to start with if we know what it meant to start with then we can say this is how it works in my life fair enough but to uh but to create meaning uh, i'll give you an example I once heard a talk in which the one giving the talk said he wanted to talk about Zacchaeus. Okay. He said, but we've heard, we've heard all kinds of talks about Zacchaeus and about Jesus and about the, the disciples. And he said, I want to talk about the tree. What? It was in my head. That's what was going on in my head. What? And that's what he talked about. That was the focus, the tree. It wasn't Zacchaeus. It wasn't Jesus. It was the tree. And his main point was, sometimes it's enough to just be there. 
Okay, that's nice. But when Jesus had that interaction with Zacchaeus, and when Luke wrote that down, I guarantee you they were not thinking about the tree. The tree was important just because it held up Zacchaeus where Jesus could see him. That was its total importance. And to and to and to rip it in my view, rip it right out of its historical setting and its historical context, and to go to the go someplace that the passage never intended us to go. And if if you want to say that sometimes it's enough to be there, then find a passage that says that. But Luke was not talking about that. I guarantee you. So we need to we need to ask what was the what was the author's intended meaning? What was he trying to get across? And if you look at the passage, you don't need the tree at all to see what he was going for. Here you have this interaction between Z Jesus and Zacchaeus, and Zacchaeus's life is transformed. It's got nothing to do with the tree. It's got everything to do with the power of Jesus to change a person's life. So at the end, he says that the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. Here was a lost one that Jesus had found and whose presence had transformed the man from a selfish, dishonest money grubber to somebody who was giving his life over to the Lord Jesus Christ and out of that becoming, gen becoming generous and honest. We don't need the tree. In fact, the tree's a hindrance if if you concentrate on the tree too much. Okay. I got a Enough question. My rant. Ms. Cordell, uh, I got a question. Yes. I've heard that passage preached dealing with desire. Um, just in comparison, so to speak, is his desire to see Jesus. Um to get a glimpse of him um, as part of the transformation process. Sort of like the uh, woman uh, who fought through the crowd just to touch his hem, uh, getting in position to see Jesus. Um, sometimes there are, um, I'll say granted, sometimes there are, I would call that secondary, but it was secondary le leading up to the primary idea. Are you following me? Yes, uh-huh. It's secondary to the primary, right? Yeah, I mean, yes, it's absolutely true. There was something in Zacchaeus that was drawn to Jesus. He had a strong desire to see him. And then in his presence, his life just bloomed. But it's all part of a process. Um, rather than just ripping something out that has nothing to do with, with the main thrust. That desire, I would, I would contend that desire is really a good thing to bring out. I would say in relationship, even if, even if you want to emphasize the desire, make sure that it's seen in the, in the context of the whole story. That makes sense. Yes. Okay. Good. Um. Okay, next. This is something I've talked about before, and I want to hit it again. At this stage in study, stay stay within the book that you are studying as much as possible. I am going to give an exception to that in a moment, but stay stay within the book. Try be determined to understand the text on its own footing. There is a place some of you have Bibles with chain references in it. There's a place for using those chain references, but not yet. Where we are in our study, it's not yet. And um, there, I, I've struggled with how to get this across because you can say, well, you know, I'm studying the Word of God and these chain references are taking me to other parts of the Word of God, so what's the problem? The problem is 
as I see it, at this at this place in our study, and I have found that this is this really works in getting into the depth of scripture. And some of you have seen this in, in what you've done so far in these exercises. Um, at this point, we don't need any distraction from just looking at the passage itself, looking at the grammar, looking at the author's intent, looking at, at the purpose, asking, asking lots of questions. Who, what, when, where, why, how, what of it, or so what, what's the meaning, that final meaning question. Um, and the, the other thing about chain reference, and in principle, it's the same thing. Some of you are familiar with um, Harmony of the Gospels. I mean, we've got Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And at some point, way, way, way back, it's very ancient, people started producing a harmony of the Gospels. And the idea is you've got Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but if I want to look at it historically and, and try to figure out how does this, when did this happen in Jesus' life and how does it relate, uh, uh, people created a harmony of the Gospels. Some of you would be familiar with the Harmony of the Gospels by A.T. Robertson and, and others have produced them. The one thing about the Harmony, uh, Harmony of the Gospels and chain references is they were they're based in Scripture and Scripture comes from God. But the chain reference itself and the Harmony of the Gospels itself is man-made. Are you following me? It was a it was a human being that decided this is how this all fits together. And if you and if you read two or three harmonies of the gospels, you will see that they don't always see eye to eye on how everything fits. And and chain references, some of them will say this passage relates to that. Some of them will say this passage relates to something totally different. Now it's it's worth considering what they have to say. But years ago, I had a professor. Uh, I was in a, in a class with a professor. Some of you will know um, D. A. Carson, and uh, he he made the point that has stuck with me all this time. God gave us Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. He did not give us a harmony of the Gospels. It's not to say that that can't be helpful. But that's not what God gave us. He gave us Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And our first responsibility is to understand each of the four of those, not some kind of harmony that puts them all together. Now, that's not to say that there's not a place for a harmony of the Gospels or a place for the, the, uh, uh, the chain references, but it's secondary to understanding the book itself. And we will come to that later. But at this point, I'm saying set all that stuff aside and concentrate on the book and how what the book is revealing to us within itself. And there are, a lot, there are other reasons for that uh, that I've mentioned before, and I, I won't belabor the, belabor or the point, but just to say these books, by and large, are meant to be understood within their own context. You don't need something outside to tell you what they mean. You need to understand them. The author is communicating something. The Holy Spirit has inspired that author to communicate something. And uh, we should just trust the process that the Holy Spirit set in set in motion in these human authors. Okay, so stay within the book as much as possible. There will be a time to go outside, and we'll talk about that more later. Now, here's uh, this is still staying within the book itself, but it may seem like I've, I'm contradicting myself, uh, but I'm not really. 
examine the broader context of any biblical passages the author quotes or alludes to. Examine the broader context of any biblical passage that the author quotes or alludes to. Occasionally in the Old Testament, Old Testament writers will uh, will quote or allude to other passages. So you see this especially in the prophets. The prophets were men of the old way. They were pointing Israel back to the original documents, Law of Moses. And uh, so they, they quote uh, the Law of Moses, make allusions and make references to the Law of Moses. But in the New Testament, and in the New Testament, we see a lot of quotations and allusions. And uh, I am indebted to a scholar. He's uh, he was more more liberal than I am, and yet I'm indebted to him, especially for one thing in this regard. It's C. H. Dodd. He wrote a book called "According to the Scriptures." And in that book, he made what I thought, I still think, was the brilliant, brilliant observation that when a New Testament writer quotes the Old Testament, he's not quoting a verse. He's quoting a context. And that you need to go back and see the whole context that he's quoting. And the more I've thought about it, the more I've thought New Testament writers expected their readers to either know the context or like us, perhaps, to go back and look it up. Uh, but I have found in my own Bible study that one of the richest things in my study has been going back to Old Testament passages that are quoted in the New Testament and, and seeing the whole context. Now, I can't tell you exactly how big the context is going to be. Sometimes we're talking about a few verses. Sometimes we may be talking about a chapter. Sometimes we might be talking about a whole book. So I can't tell you exactly how big the context is, but there's always some kind of context that that passage is coming out of that applies to, to what the author is saying. And it brings out, the more you understand the context, the more it brings out the meaning of, that the New Testament author is, um, is getting across. I'll give you a few examples. In Luke 17, verse 32, Jesus simply says, remember Lot's wife. What? Remember, remember Lot's wife. He doesn't say anything more about uh, right there. Just before that, he's talked about Lot and the destruction of the cities. And then there's a little thing in between. And then and and, um, and then when he's talking about people who are, you've got two in a field, one's taken, one's left. You've got two in a house, one's, one's taken, one's left. And then he says, remember Lot's wife. Well, if we look at the whole context, that is going to take us back to Genesis 19. It may also take us beyond Genesis 19, but ge genuinely to Genesis 19. In Genesis 19, we have the story of Lot and the angels. The angels go into Sodom. And um, it's a wicked place. It's an evil, evil place. And here you've got Lot, who is not evil. It can be argued he's weak, wrongheaded, shouldn't have ever been in that city. Okay. That shows something about his own spiritual weakness that he got there at all. And yet he was trying to keep himself pure in the midst of this terrible place. Eventually, well, I won't go through the whole story, but eventually the, the angels tell Lot and his family to leave. To leave Sodom because it's about to be destroyed. Leave and don't look back. So they're leaving. Sod Lot, his wife, and his two daughters. Are all leaving. And as they're leaving and the city is being destroyed by God, Lot's wife looks back and is turned into a 
pillar of salt. Now, in context, what? Why did what's going on? Because she had she was leaving too much of what she loved. The house is there, the furniture is there, all our possessions are there. We made a life for ourselves there. There was a reason why we ended up in the city rather than out in the countryside. And she looks back. Does that have application for us? Yes. But it, but if if you only concentrate on remember Lot's wife, you miss an awful lot. You need to go back and see the whole context of what Jesus is referring to. What he's saying is basically, at the end of the world, don't look back. <laughs> that all means nothing. Don't look back. Okay, another passage. Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11 is sometimes called the roll, roll call of faith. The writer of Hebrews speaks of the nature of faith, and then he goes through a whole long series, starting with starting with Cain, and he's got he's got Abraham there, and he's got Moses, and I mean he's got this whole list of people and, and, and this refrain, by faith, so and so did this, by faith, so and so did that, by faith. Um, he expects he expects his readers to know the context. When he speaks of, I said, I think I said Cain, I should have said uh, Abel. Um, when he speaks of Abel, he expects you to understand in Genesis 4 what Abel did and why that was by faith, why that was an act of faith. And the same thing about Abraham and so on. These are examples of faith and we don't fully appreciate them unless we understand the whole context out of which they are coming. Another example. In Romans 1, verse 17, we have the primary text for Paul's sermon in Romans. We have the primary theme and uh, it comes from a quotation from, of all things, the book of Habakkuk. Most of us don't know Habakkuk well. Habakkuk 2.4, the righteous shall live by faith. And if you look at Romans, Romans, it actually serves as kind of an outline for the first part of Romans. Um, he talks about the righteous. He talks about living. He talks about faith. Okay. But if you go back, all he does is quote that verse. But if you go back to Habakkuk, you see that Habakkuk is, is a man wrestling with faith. I love, I love Habakkuk because he's a questioner, maybe a complainer, but he's a, he's definitely a questioner. And he starts out by saying, Lord, this is such a wicked society. Why aren't you doing anything about all this evil? All this wrongdoing that's going on in our society. Question. Okay, we may have had the same question. And the Lord comes to him and said, don't worry about it, Habakkuk. I'm going to deal with them. I'm going to send the Babylonians to beat up on you. And that'll make things right. And then Habakkuk, still, he has a worse problem than he had to start with. He says, but Lord... They're worse than we are. How can you work, how can you use the more wicked to punish the less wicked? Granted, we're wicked, but they're they're worse than we are. And the Lord says, "Don't worry about it. I'm going to send somebody else to beat up on the Babylonians." What do you say? Oh, you know what Habakkuk says in chapter three. He has this hymn of praise. And in that hymn of praise, he says, in effect, although everything goes away, although I lose everything, I will depend on you and I will praise you. The righteous shall live by faith. And But I think understanding the whole book of Habakkuk 
helps us in understanding what Paul's doing in Romans. He pulled out this great, great illustration. Okay, another uh, another illustration. Luke chapter 2, verse 4. And it just seems like, what should I say? It's easy to miss. It just seems so common sense. Luke says that uh, that Jesus was born in Bethlehem. He talks about the birth. He talks about the the angels appearing to the shepherds out in the field. And um, nice story. But there's an illusion there. Bethlehem is the key. When you go back to the Old Testament, who's born in Bethlehem? Who? What significant person is born in Bethlehem? David. And it, and it is revealed in the prophets. Well, even before the prophets in in Second Samuel, that someone from David's line the royal line, the kingly line, one from his lineage will always sit on the throne of, of Israel. And he was born in Bethlehem. In, in Micah chapter 5, and I think that's the specific background to Luke 2, in M Micah chapter 5, Micah specifically speaks of Bethlehem. And if you go to that passage, there's all, all sorts of allusions there. He talks about shepherds. I, I won't go into, I, I'd love to go into it more, but, uh, but there's an allusion there. And if you go back and look at the whole context of, of David and Bethlehem and Micah 5, you, you get, the, you get a, more, a powerful meaning to what... Um, what Luke is doing in Luke chapter 2. I've gotten carried away with illustrations, but I'll give you one more. In Matthew chapter 2, verse 17, well, it started earlier in chapter 2. You have the birth of Jesus and um, the wise men or the magi come looking for the... They're, they're pagans, by the way. To the best of our knowledge, they're probably Zoroastrians. And Zoroastrians believed in astrology. And so they've been looking at the stars. And, and, and in some way, either because there's scripture or there's something in the stars that God revealed to them, they've come looking for the, the one born to be king of Israel. And if you're looking for the new king, who do you, who do you go to? The old king right? <laughs> Herod. Well, Herod pretends to be, to be interested. Well, he is interested, but for the, all the wrong reasons, he wants to make sure that there's no competitor for his throne. And he calls in religious leaders from Jerusalem, and he asks, where, where's the Messiah supposed to be born? What do they say? Bethlehem. And he tells the wise men, well, go to Bethlehem and see if you can find the the uh, this new king because I want to worship him um, and then come back and report to me so the they they go off they find Jesus but it's revealed to them by God that they aren't aren't, aren't to trust Herod or go back to him and so they leave by a different way Joseph takes his little family Mary and Jesus to Egypt after Herod the Great dies, he comes back. And here's the point I'm wanting to make. When he comes back, Matthew says, this is to fulfill the words, out of Egypt I have called my son. Now, I used to think that all prophecy was what I would call straight line prophecy. Prophesied it here, and it fulfilled it here. Okay, straight line from one to the other. 
But then I ran into this, this thing where Matthew says, this was to fulfill that. And what's being fulfilled is out of Egypt, I have called my son. Well, that's from Hosea chapter 11, verse one. And picking up on Dodd and going back and looking at the whole context, I went back to Hosea chapter 11. And to my shock, it's obvious this has nothing to do with the Messiah. The son in Hosea 11 is Israel. And the picture is God delivered Israel from Egypt and called Israel his son. And, and But he became a disobedient son, a rebellious son. Read Hosea 11. It's all about Israel and about Israel's unfaithfulness. So what do you do with that? I've looked at the bigger context, but it doesn't seem to fit with what Matthew's saying. Well, the problem wasn't with Matthew. The problem was with me. I had limited Matthew, according to my own thinking, as, one, as just a straight line. And then the more I looked at it, the more I realized Matthew is using this prophecy or this statement in Hosea. He's using it in a way that's different than, than I realized could even be done. But it's exactly what he's done. Was Israel the son of God in one sense? Yes. Right? God calls him his son. Israel's my son. He was the disobedient son. And in Jesus, the Messiah, we have the son of God, who's the obedient son. I think rather than being, this is a prophecy pointing to the coming of Jesus, it's this is a picture of the disobedience of, of the people of God and how the, the obedience of the true son God in the flesh is going to make everything right. I don't know that I've said that very well, but I, I believe that that's exactly what's going on there. And if you look at how Matthew uses fulfillment and what Jesus did in his ministry, you'll see, and we talked about this a little bit last week, but Jesus, for instance, this is a pointer to what I'm talking about. Jesus, um, in his ministry, one of the first things he did, he chose 12 apostles. 12 is a symbolic number. We must not miss that. There were 12 tribes of Israel, 12 patriarchs, 12 apostles. The 12 apostles are meant to reflect the 12 tribes and 12 patriarchs. And it's a way of Jesus saying, Old Israel, that was old Israel. I'm creating a new Israel. And and 12 is the number that shows that I'm creating a new Israel. And um, that goes along the, with the lines of the old Israel was the disobedient son. I am the obedient son. Okay. I, I want to move on to my next section, but I will... Uh, take questions or comments about that. Any of that. Is the idea, is the, what I'm hoping is, is the general idea, whether you agree with all the interpretations, but is the general idea that when the New Testament quotes or alludes to something in the Old Testament, you should go back and look at the whole context. Is that clear and does it make sense yes i follow your point very yes. well however i do i haven't got my head wrapped around when to do that and when not to for example you use the example of bethlehem being the key in that passage okay that's a word well there's when you look at chain references, there are a lot of words that follow themes through a lot of scripture. So when do you know when to pick up and go back and look at the Old Testament scripture? And when are you just following chain references? 
when do you do that and when do you not is what I'm asking. You need to stop asking good questions. <laughs> Hard questions. Um, as I'll think, I'll give it more thought. But as far as I know, there's no there's no f hard and fast rule to answer your question. Um, you have to deal with what makes what makes sense. Um, partial part of it is what what makes sense when, for instance, with the Bethlehem thing um throughout the old testament bethlehem well starting starting with david when he's called a bethlehemite in in first samuel when he, when samuel goes he goes to bethlehem to anoint him as king and um i don't as far as i know bethlehem's never mentioned before that but after that all the references to bethlehem are going to be connected with david so in that way, any of those references would point us to this is this is where J David's going to be born. As far as going to Micah 5, the way I did, nobody else does this, and I'm always suspicious of myself when I come up with something that nobody else does. <laughs> and yet I had uh, I had a former st student who said I ought to write a write an article on it. If you go back to Micah 5, which mentions Bethlehem, and mentions it in the, if you look at Micah 5, you'll see it, it mentions it in the connection of the coming Messiah. It's a king who was from ancient of times and will be. Okay. But it's more than that. When you start going through Micah 5 and comparing it to Luke 2, You've got the same key words in the same order. And my conclusion is Luke had Micah 5 in front of him when he was writing. He knew that that was, and, and rather than just pulling it out and saying, there's this prophecy. No, he get, he get, it becomes an outline because he sees the very thing that Micah talked about taking place in his lifetime does that so that's what pointed me to do that chain references may point us to that but we've got to be careful that that we're not simply going with the chain references and missing what the passage is actually talking about and th this is a process where it's very important that we keep thinking and growing I wish I had a hard, fast rule. You, you know, if you do it this way, it will always give you the right. Yeah, and the reason I asked that question is, and that's a perfect example you just went through with Micah 5 and Luke 2, but I don't know the scripture well enough to read Luke 2 and know that's Micah 5. It would take me an awful lot of work and a lot of digging to end up marrying those two up. Well, let me let me say a lot of this has to do with where you start and where you end up. My goal, as I said at the beginning of class, my goal for this course is that everybody will be a better interpreter at the at the end of the course than they were at the beginning, no matter where you started. I don't care where you start. I care that you grew. And throughout life, we grow. Mm -hmm. Um and the more we grow, the more we begin to see things like that. If, I mean, on one level, if you just know it's Bethlehem, you know something about it. Right. Even if you, okay. don't, even if you don't link it with Micah 5, you know this has to do with, this is the birthplace of the Messiah. And so when the angels come and say, born to you in this city of David is a Savior, who is Christ the Lord, you say, of course it is. Right. <laughs> He's born okay. in the right place. So... You might not see the full thing that I was talking about, but you see a lot, even without seeing that. Okay, very good. Okay, good. Anybody else?
Okay, let me go on. In, in this part of our study, consider all the possible meanings and interpretations. Notice I said consider. Consider all the possible meanings and interpretations. At this point, it's more important to have the right, to know the right possibilities than to have all the right answers. Consider all the possible meanings and interpretations. At this point, it is more important to know the possibilities than to have all the right answers. Uh, let me let me give some examples of what I'm talking about. Well, probably probably all of you, some passage or passages will come to mind where there's a whole variety of interpretations. Some people say it means this. Some people say it means that. Some people say it means something else. Okay. And I'll give some examples, but probably, probably all of you could give an example or examples of this. I'll go back to a class I once took in which uh, it was on James, 1st and 2nd Peter, and Jude. At the beginning of the class, the teacher said, good news, you only have four papers to write in this class, four short papers, not a, one long paper, just four short papers. And each paper is to be on the introduction to one of these books. So you start with James and 1st Peter, 2nd Peter, and Jude. Okay paper on each book, and it's introductory kinds of things. So you're going to discuss who the author was, who the recipients were, what the main theme is, uh, the, the flow of the book or the outline as near as you can find it, um, when it was written, you know, introductory kinds of stuff. I thought, oh, this sounds easy enough. And then he said, oh, yeah, one thing. You can only use a Bible and a concordance. No other resources. I said, huh? And when I started working on these papers, I realized how dependent I had become on other resources because I would think, I wonder what so-and-so says about that. Oh, I can't look at that. I wonder what, no, I can't, I, I, I can't see what he says. I've got to just look at this. And part of what he wanted from us in these papers was possibilities. And, and what he said was, they may be totally crazy ideas, but I want to know what all the possibilities are. I want, you, I want you to know what all the possibilities are, as near as you can. And so I'll give you one example. Book of James. Book of James begins, James, the slave of Jesus Christ. What? Okay, who's I, I knew what I had always heard, who I had heard that this James was. I okay, but but if I'm thinking of all the possibilities, then I got to think of all the possibilities, even even ones that I would immediately discount. So, James, the half brother of Jesus, James, son of Zebedee, the apostle, James, son of Alphaeus, the apostle. A James that um, a, a first century James who is not named anywhere else in the New Testament. Okay, a Christian. He's a Christian. His name is James, but he's never mentioned anywhere else. Um, somebody and my wife will give me a hard time on this one. She already did. She said, no, that's not even possible. Yeah, but you're thinking of all the possibilities, but she said, it's not a possibility. Okay, somebody used James' name in order to give, give, give the book credibility. Now, the reason, I, the reason I put that in is there are people who believe that. I discount it. I don't believe it, but there are people who believe it. And... And if we want to be able to say, no, that's not right, we ought to have some idea of why of, of why we don't think it's right. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, and also another possibility would be, because if you read James, it's very Jewish. 
so is it possible that this was a Jewish book that was taken over by the Christians? And so it was originally written by somebody else. Okay, so all those possibilities. By the way, I ended up with a possibility that I had always heard to start with, and that was James, the half-brother of Jesus. Reason, reason I didn't go with either one of the apostles is uh, James, the son of Zebedee, died. He was put to death by, by Herod um, fairly early on. And the book of James seems to assume a church that's been in existence long enough that it's gotten, how do I want to put it? He addresses dead orthodoxy. Takes a while to have dead orthodoxy. Newfound faith isn't dead orthodoxy. <laughs> it takes a while to get there. And, and so I would say it was, he just died too soon. Could be James, son of Alphaeus. The problem is we know nothing else about him. And whoever this James was who wrote the letter, he was so well known that he could just say, James. James is a slave of Jesus Christ. And, and expect people to know who he was. So that gives you an idea of the possibilities. Let me give you a couple of other examples. In Genesis 126, in the creation account, God says, let us make man in our image. Let us. Most of us have heard that's the Trinity. Is that the only possibility? No, it's actually not. I'm not saying you shouldn't believe that, but I'm saying there are other possibilities. And if we're going to think, try to think through what are the possibilities, what are the possible meanings, then we need to th think about what are the possibilities there are. One would be that God is speaking the God the Father is speaking to the angels and that human beings are going to in some way look like angels. I don't believe that one, but that's a possibility. Another possibility would be what's been called the plural of majesty, that God is so great that the author uses a plural to bring out his greatness. It would be sort of like when Queen Elizabeth was alive and she would say, we, and she was speaking of herself, we believe this or we do this or anyway thinking through what are the possibilities is is is, uh, is valuable at this point another example first corinthians 15 verse 29 paul speaks of people who are being baptized on behalf of the dead as the esv translates it what? Nowhere else in the New Testament does it speak of being baptized, uh, people being baptized for the dead. So what are the possibilities? Well, one possibility is that whatever was going on there, Paul didn't necessarily approve it. He just made a reference to it. He doesn't ever say for sure that this is something that he advocates. He just says, why would people do that if if there's no resurrection, okay? Um, another possibility would be the one uh, that the Mormons have taken, and that is that people can be baptized for people who are already dead and have never been baptized. If you've ever wondered why the Mormons are so interested in genealogies, that's the reason. In the temple in Salt Lake City, People are being baptized, or they used to be. I don't know if they still do it or not. I assume they do. They were being baptized for people who were dead from those genealogies. So you'd have somebody baptized for Napoleon. Okay. I don't believe that, but I'm saying that is an outlandish possibility. But the, the problem with the passage is it's so unusual. Another possibility would be it's people who are being baptized into the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, and they're being said to be baptized for the dead, spiritual dead. Anyway, possibilities, possibilities, possibilities. It's a very difficult passage, and unless you come up with a lot of possibilities and why, and eventually work through it, why you reject this one or that one or the other one. 
um, you'll never come to a, a decent, uh, decent place with it. Okay, let me see. Let me continue. I probably could come up with some others, but uh, um, the idea again is you're looking for possible meanings and possible interpretations. Um, going along with that, well, no, I'll come back to this. At this point, I'll say, while you're while you're looking through the passage, I. I I think invariably it's going to hit you um, and it should begin making application of the text to yourself. Now that, that may change. It may be enhanced or it may be changed when we move to the next, to the next thing, but already thinking about, okay, I'm grappling with the meaning and I'm beginning to see what this meant, what the original author's purpose and meaning was and by extension i'm seeing how this applies to me that it calls me to greater service it calls me to greater love it calls me to greater holiness it gives me a a, a greater vision of god it helps me appreciate the true nature of jesus christ and what he did on my behalf whatever i'm, I'm beginning to apply it to myself and to say, well, and the bottom line is really what I believe and how I'm going to behave. Um, so we're, we're already thinking about, we don't, we're not setting it in concrete yet, but we're already thinking about how it applies. And finally, we're gathering questions for which you are unable uh, or you're gathering questions that you're unable to answer. Now that may sound like a strange thing for me to say, but I believe in this, in this part of the study, it's very healthy to be able to ask and answer questions, but it's also healthy to ask questions that I can, I don't have an answer for. I've grappled with this. I've thought about it a lot. And I am not, I'm just not quite sure. Maybe I have possibilities, the possible interpretations or whatever, or, or I just have this question and I, but I don't know what the answer is. Now in the next section, in the next step of this process, that will help focus us in our reading and our grappling with the text to find answers to those questions that we can't answer, we haven't been able to answer on our own. Okay, give me some reflection. Tell me what you're thinking. Well, one of the big takeaways, can you hear me? Uh, yes, I can uh, hear you. What did you say? One of the big takeaways I've taken away so far is just the Going back and getting context for, uh, as we discussed earlier, going back to get context for those those scriptures that the author uh, may mention in order to go get the full context to bring forth a better meaning to what we're reading currently to kind of give us a better uh, understanding of what the authorial intent was. So yeah. that's 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 a big takeaway for me. Yeah, I I have found that so helpful to me because. The author quotes or alludes to those passages on purpose. That's part of his intent. That's that's part of his purpose is to bring those in so that we'll see that that is part of his message. It enhances his message. And I, I have found it just so, so helpful over and over that looking back at that wider context, I've just seen things back there that I would have never guessed by just looking at the at the illusion or the quotation. 
it's like, oh, that's what you were saying. That's what you saw there. Not only are the biblical writers inspired, but they knew their Bibles better than we do. And we just need to get comfortable with that. <laughs> okay, anybody else? That's a good takeaway. Great takeaway. With Cornell, mine is the historical context. That's one that uh, sometimes I can get lost into. Um, just getting grappling with the history. If you can see the history between the, the two uh, texts and how they are they're uh, referencing one another uh, when you're going back, uh, that is a huge uh, win in getting understanding uh, and bringing it new meaning, especially when you're going to apply, applying it to yourself. Well, and that is that also leads me to part of the reason that I say the more the more you learn the more you grow the more you can just plug it into this method um, the more you know about I mean okay somebody's quoting Isaiah the more you know about the context of Isaiah the more you can bring that to bear on the on on the book that you're studying in in what he quotes or alludes to at the same time the more you know about the history of the period in which either the old testament book or the new testament book was written the more you understand the period the more it can help you understand the context now, I'll talk about that more in the future, and I don't want us, some people, I believe, hijack the text with supposed historical backgrounds, and I think we've got to be very careful about that. Historical backgrounds are important. I love history, okay? I'm a hi history fanatic. I love history, but but you need to keep it in its place it can help you understand the text more, but you don't want it to hijack the text. And all of a sudden you're saying the text says something totally different than it actually says because of some kind of imagined historical background. But finding the, I think finding the interaction between the Old Testament quotation or allusion and how the New Testament is using it is absolutely invaluable. Okay, JD. Uh, yeah, just following along with what you're teaching tonight and what we've gone over previously um, in earlier sessions, I'm thinking about Paul um, and his epistles that he wrote to the various different churches, the Gentile churches. Paul references a lot of the Old Testament scriptures in uh, various different places, various different ways. Well, as I think through what you're talking about, the people that received Paul's epistles in a lot of cases would not have that Old Testament reference to draw the context from. So they would be coming pretty much strictly from his epistle, correct? Yeah. So I, it, I will I will put a go ahead. footnote on that, but yeah, I would I would agree that that's true. And that's part of the reason why I say understand the book within its own context as much as possible. But continue. Okay, well, it was just it's kind of raising a paradox where we need to understand it as it stands, but we also need to get the conceptual context from what he's referring to. Um but yet the way the um, author intended or it was received at the time of writing would not involve the Old Testament context. They wouldn't have that. So do you or don't you, I guess? You understand my question? 
Yeah, I think I think I do. You, you you tell me if I'm hitting anywhere near it, and if I'm not, I'll take another shot at it. There are two observations I would make. One is, in some ways, the Gentiles of the first Gentile Christians of the first century were, um, in some ways, more like us than the Jewish Christians. Not just that they were Gentiles. But um, we we probably don't know our Old Testaments as well as the Jewish Christians of the first century did. Agreed. Yeah. So we're in this in the way we're in the same place as those Gentile Christians. It doesn't mean that the context isn't there. It means we need to work hard to begin to get it. I would also say that at times it appears to me that New Testament writers, not just Paul, but New Testament writers in general, assume that their Gentile Christian readers will understand their quotations and allusions. I, I, I think that those early Christians, Gentiles, probably spent a lot more time in their Bibles than we may give them credit for. Well, they didn't have individual ones, but as we know... We know that the reading of the scriptures was an important part of early Christian worship from the earliest times. We we think in terms of preaching, and they had preaching, but I believe they read a lot more than we do. And in sometimes reading one of Paul's letters, for instance, that may have been the sermon. So I I, I think you're I think you're right. And what it says to me is those those Gentile Christians weren't so different from us. Okay, so just to elaborate on that, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, but as I understand it, um, they didn't have Bibles that had scrolls of the different books. Mm -hmm. And it was very expensive to acquire those. So a lot of the synagogues, as well as I'm assuming the early churches, would not have the full set. They would only have one, two, three, five, whatever they could get. So could one assume that when Paul was addressing them, he knew that and he only referenced the ones they have because what would be the point of referencing Isaiah if they didn't have Isaiah? You understand what I mean? Yeah, I do. Um, good question. I don't know totally. Um, I, I think that's I think it's a good question to, to ask, and I'm not sure I've got a good answer for it. There are a couple of things that occur to me. We, I mean, in the end, we don't know what they had exactly. Right. We just don't know. Um, we do know that Paul makes allusions to things and that there is a wider context of understanding. Well, I'll, I'll say it this way. Scripture meets us wherever we are. There are some Bible stories that very small children can understand just fine. Okay. And they love those stories. Do they get all the depth out of them that's possible for an adult? No. But on a certain level, they understand it. A new Christian understands things on a certain level. They should, uh, but somebody who's been a Christian for longer a long time who, who's lived with the Lord and lived with the scriptures for a long time understands more depth and should. And so I think, I think that's part of it in the scriptures. We see these quotations and allusions, for instance, but it's not just that it's like the illustration I used of the, that I got on the Gospel of John, it's like peeling back the layers of an onion. You you can go deeper and deeper and deeper. On one level, I mean, I use I use John evangelistically with hardcore unbelievers, okay, and they can understand it on a certain level. They get it. They get this is saying something really amazing about Jesus. 
But for Christians, the more you spend with John or Matthew or Mark or Romans, the more you see that you didn't see before. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think to a certain extent, we've got that going on that the scriptures met th those early readers wherever they were and called them to a better place. And um, if they knew more, they saw more. If they knew less, they saw less, but they still saw. And I think that should be encouraging, should really be encouraging to us. Wherever we are, the scriptures meet us there and call us to something more. And the more we the more we go to them, the more we can see in them. It's a, sure. It is a very, it's a terrible thing when, when somebody gets so used to the scriptures that they don't think they can learn anything more from it. And they just die there, die on that level. That's terrible. The scriptures are so full of wonderful things about God and what, what he wants for us. Um, so I hope that helped. Thank you. Your question. Anybody else? It's Cornell. Um, I, I was studying uh, for a children's uh, teaching that I was doing. And this is um, something a uh, um, minister said. He said that uh, we propose that we are more knowledgeable than the past times because of the uh, information process that we can get information quicker. But he said, if you, through um, history, we're still perplexed with the marvel of architecture and structure that was being able to be achieved during a time when there was no machines, or equipment that we can fathom to construct these things. So how do we pre-propose that we're more intelligent than those who were at that time? Um, mm -hmm. that they is, went, that's good. Continue. Because they had, and when I'm saying this, I look at when they went to school, their whole school was about writing that text and the, writing those scriptures. And when they went to school, it was about memorization of those things and how they had apprentices of apprentices and apprentices. And their whole job may have been to um, rewrite those scriptures so they can get the, the uh, news out and those letters out. So when the letter came, they, they immediately went into drafting those things to get that message out. So we don't we can't fathom how many scriptures or how many things were were uh, sent out or um, how they got the message out. We just assumed that uh, they didn't have access as much as we think they did. Um, just because we come in, as you said before, with our own pre pre preposition and pre-proposed thoughts on what the conditions were. Good. You said a lot of good things there. I'll piggyback on some of it. Um, We, uh, you know, I stick with, we don't know exactly what they had. And, and it is true that having the en entire, all the scriptures that are available, that were available, w would have been very expensive. And yet there were some Christians early on who could write and those letters of Paul and Peter and Jude were were copied. Some Christians somewhere copied them and sent them on. Um, so that that that's a factor we should keep in mind is if they were copying those, then they were probably copying Isaiah and Genesis and Deuteronomy at, at some point. Um, Also, we, I'll call it, we can have a modern arrogance 
where we think we're smarter or we think we're more knowledgeable or we have access to more resources than those people in the past. Well, the way I think of it is we have advantages, but they had advantages too. What I mean is in the first century, I had a, I had a teacher who um, was talking about the parables of Jesus and he said, the Jesus first hearers had instantaneous exegesis. And what, what he meant by that was <clears throat> they didn't need to read an article in a Bible dictionary about, a, about sowers going forth to sow seed or, uh, or shepherds or a, a woman who would lose a coin and what, what all might be involved in that. They, they, they knew what that, all that stuff meant. That was part of their experience. We need educated help to understand it. So we have resources, but in many cases, they had firsthand knowledge. And I think it's also true. It seems like constantly archaeologists are finding some amazing discovery of something from ancient times where the ancients were able to do things that boggle our minds. How, how could they do that? How could they know that? How, um, so I, I think we just need to have a certain humility. But I also, as I said, I would say we have certain advantages. We have some wonderful tools for biblical understanding. We ha have some wonderful insights into history and culture that generations past may not have had. But on the other hand, they also have had certain advantages, especially in the biblical period. They they knew what was going on. I mean, when, when Paul wrote to the Colossians and you've got the so-called Colossian heresy, we scratch our heads over what it means. The Colossians didn't. They knew exactly what the problem was. We're not quite sure. Some people think they are, but I'm not. I'm skeptical about whether they are really know or not. But he, when he wrote to the Philippians, they knew when when he on the fourth chapter, when he mentions Yodia and Syntyche and they're not getting along, the Philippians knew that situation. They knew those ladies and they knew what that was doing to the church. We have to figure it out by reading between the lines as you read Philippians. When, uh, when one of the prophets speaks of what was going on in their society, they knew what was going on. We have to read very carefully to figure out what was going on. So they had certain advantages. We have certain advantages. Oh, and I'll, one more I'll mention was the, the Hebrew language and the Greek language, respectively, were that was their first language. We're reading it in translation, and our translations are very good. I'm not, I'm not discounting them at all. They're very good. But they, they had a certain insight into the original languages that we we have to work real hard to begin to understand because it was their language. And uh, we have advantages. They had advantages. But uh, one of the points that struck me to, this evening very strongly was just the idea that Gentile Christians of the first century and Gentile Christians of today in some ways are similar in our own, in some ways we're very dissimilar. Okay. We didn't, most of us didn't come from a pagan background. <clears throat> when Paul spoke of meat sacrifice to idols, that's not our experience, but it was theirs. But in, in some ways, as far as the knowledge of the scriptures and, and trying to figure out the context of some of these things, we are we're more like them than uh, than we might all we, we might uh, always envision. 
thank you this has been really good interaction i appreciate so much your hard work and your desire to know and your contributions and your interaction uh, with with me and uh, in this class next week we will move on we've been we've been looking at studying the bible without the help of the other books except the bible in a concordance and uh, next week we're going to open up the floodgates and talk about how to study with the help of other other books and uh I look forward to uh, continuing our uh, continuing our discussion. Let's have a prayer together. Our Father in heaven, we thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for uh, other people who love you and love your word and for the interaction between us. And um we remember the scripture that says the as iron sharpens iron. So one person sharpens another. And we ask that you would help us to sharpen each other in our understanding of you and our understanding of your will and uh, in our understanding of your word and our devotion to obeying and allowing your word to mold our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Have a blessed everybody. Good night.